and welcome. I'm so excited that you're here all the way from an hour behind us in the UK. And, and some degrees below you as well. <laughs> I can see by your clothing. <laughs> you're dressed a little warm and we're not sure whether that fire behind you is real and on or not. Um, that one, well, it's real, it's not on, but the other side of the wall is one the same that will be on shortly. <laughs> Okay, nice, nice. Yeah, hopefully we won't be having to have fires too soon here in Cape Town. So, Tony, I think people joined today because they were excited about what you do, which is helping, I know it's outsourced providers mainly, to win on social media when it comes to the wonderful world of recruitment. But I know that the principles that we talk about today will apply to internal talent acquisition teams as well. So there are things for everybody to learn and everybody to share in. So I would like to ask you to do a little bit more of your introduction, just so you can also share your story of how you came to foundsocialhire.com. I know it started in 2012. Um, but yeah, let me hand over to you because you will tell your story best. Oh, thank you. And um, thank you for the invite today. It's great to be on. Um, and please feel free to ping questions through um the more you know input i get on things you'd like to cover the the better um in terms of my background so i have been working with recruitment teams and recruitment businesses for 24 years um i started my career as a strategy consultant um, in, a, in a management consultancy firm and then after a few years i left and set up a job board business uh, so that was in 2000, um, and that became the biggest uh, job board in Europe for management consulting and IT consulting. So clients there were, you know, the likes of Accenture and McKinsey and IBM and so on, plus all the recruitment businesses that served uh, that sector or wanted to headhunt people out of those businesses and take them into industry. Um, and that takes me through, uh, I sold that business and then set up Social Hire in 2012. And because of that background, uh, it made a lot of sense for me to continue serving professional services firms. So working with recruitment businesses more than any other type of business, uh, and then obviously also management consultancies um, and yeah, similar B2B businesses that have you know a particular audience that they want to go after and either win as clients or win as business partners or hire from. Um, mm. And yeah, we're one of very few agencies in the world that, you know, have really specialist knowledge of recruitment specifically. Uh, and we work with recruitment businesses all around the English speaking world. Um, do more business in US and Canada than anywhere else. Um, but yeah, right across UK, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Europe, all over. Love it. And Tony, I know that when I was um, looking at your profile and reading about social hire, you talk about social selling and social media marketing. So mm -hmm. for those who are not so familiar with those terms, please tell us a little bit more about what that means and the difference between those two. So I think I can best illustrate this with an example from our personal lives and email marketing to, to make the comparison. So if you imagine that you're going to go and buy a new kitchen and you go onto the website of whatever the kitchen retailer is in, in, in your area and you book him for an appointment for, you know, a number of weeks from now to go in and, you know, meet them, see the kitchens, plan one up, et cetera. Um, at that point, you probably have ticked the box and you've been added to that company's email newsletter and you start receiving from them, you know, email newsletters, perhaps with advice on designing a kitchen or with client testimonials from their business or a behind the scenes look at here's how, you know, here's what goes into making our wonderful kitchens, that kind of stuff. Then you get to the point where you've had, uh, you, you've gone into the showroom, you've met a particular sales representative and you, you know, built a bit of rapport with them. And then after the meeting, you get two things. You carry on getting the, the, the newsletters from the company with you know, insights about their company and their products and how wonderful they are. But you also get personal follow-up from 
that particular sales representative that you met. Maybe they email you a few days later to see what follow-up questions you might have or whether you need some financing options to be able to proceed or maybe they leave you a voicemail or they send you a video with a mock-up of what your, your kitchen would look like. So the distinction I'm making there from an email point of view, we, we can all relate to that. One is fairly impersonal. You know, if you get an email newsletter from a company, you wouldn't normally hit reply and start interacting with that. Um, and, and you wouldn't feel like you're talking to a particular individual in that business and, and building some rapport with them. The other one is very much, you know, it is a one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, and in terms of social media marketing and social selling, I would say the distinction is pretty much the same. So social media marketing is you as a recruitment business, or if you're an employer, you as a potential employer of, of candidates, you know, getting your message out there one to many is social media marketing. So if you as an employer have, I don't know, shared an interview with someone who works in your business for people to, you know, understand a little bit what it's like to work in your company, that's social media marketing. The people seeing that, they're not forming a relationship with one particular recruiter in your team, but they are building up a better picture of what it would be like to work in that business. Um, whereas if they get interaction from a specific recruiter in that business or from the founder of a recruitment business, uh, then that is social selling. It's, it's an individual building up relationship with someone to the point where something could be encouraged to happen, whether that's making a sale, winning a new client, um, or whether that's winning over a candidate and helping them uh, you know, secure their next position. So mm -hmm. I hope that's helpful as an anecdote. Yes. That, that's how I think about the two. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful anecdote. Thanks, Tony. So if we think about social media marketing and social selling, I was really interested in the latest research that you have been sharing on LinkedIn and I'm sure on many other platforms. But it was really interesting to see what you're sharing in terms of what, what people are really responding to now. Mm. Um, so please tell us more about that because it, it talks, for me, it talked to not so much that mass visibility that perhaps LinkedIn is encouraging but more the personal value adding approach. So please tell us what you found in your research in terms of what's winning for, for, for recruiters out there. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So I've got two sources of insight in terms of what's working. One is obviously what we are seeing with all the clients that we work with around the world. Um, and the sort of headline from that is, I don't believe that most people get lots of business wins from achieving mass visibility on LinkedIn or any of the other social platforms. We obviously in our homepage feed see people whose posts are getting huge numbers of comments and, and engagement and visibility, um, but that really is a very, very small minority uh, of users that we're actually seeing there. The vast majority of businesses and individuals within those businesses don't get anything like uh, that level of visibility. Um, and so towards the tail end of last year, uh, we decided to start interviewing founders of B2B companies, a lot of them recruitment businesses, to find out, you know, what their experiences were of using social media and specifically of trying to get real business wins, real client wins uh, from what they were doing on social media. And initially, we interviewed 130 people and we published the results uh, from that um, early this year. And then we've carried on interviewing more people. So we're now at 170 uh, founders that we've interviewed. And the results of that, we've just updated on the site this week. Um, I'm going to have a post go live on LinkedIn about that uh, towards the end of uh, our, our conversation today. So I'll drop that link in uh, the comments a little bit later. Um, and we'd love to get your, you know, your feedback and, and what you've taken away from today's session uh, in the comments there. But the single biggest uh, thing that I would stress from those findings, 35 of the 170 firms are really getting very significant 
client wins from social media. So if you're a recruitment agency, you know, and you're one of those 35 firms, you are regularly picking up new client wins from specifically what you're doing on social media. And for most of those firms, that actually means what they're doing on LinkedIn. So it can be a really big contributor. Um, most of the rest of the, the, the firms we interviewed uh, fall into a few categories. Um, some of them uh, uh, just get so much business from other sources that they haven't really invested that much effort into social media. So that's obviously a you know, nice situation to be in. Um, yeah. A lot of firms believe social media is important and they are investing time and effort into it. And they do have sort of anecdotal evidence that it is contributing to the business. You know, when they have meetings with people, they'll hear from them that, you know, they saw something they posted on LinkedIn or they've loved watching your videos or they picked up some great tips or whatever. But it's so it's in it's influencing people, um, but they can't point to any specific regular client wins that they're actually getting from social mm -hmm. media. And that's where those 35 out of the 170 really differ. They have figured out something that they do on, on LinkedIn and social media that regularly brings them in client wins. And, and a similar you know, um, approach could be thought of in terms of generating candidate flow as well. Mm. Um, the single biggest thing though, Jane, there is it's six to one, the ratio of people who are winning business through taking a targeted niche approach and just mm. building up relationships with a core set of decision makers in their industry versus those who are getting client wins from having achieved mass visibility. Yeah. So six times less likely you're going to succeed on LinkedIn if you're trying to chase celebrity status and, and getting seen a huge amount. Um, mm -hmm. There's only a very small portion of uh, firms that actually and, and founders that that pull that off and really succeed to the point where it's actually bringing them a flow of business. Mm. Um, so there's lots of other findings yeah. we can dive into from that research. Uh, but yeah. certainly that is the really key message. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Tony. And it's about, so you're saying it's not about the mass visibility. It's about that targeted niche approach with decision makers. So, and that's what's bringing the client wins. And then I remember reading something about, though, that it's a little counterintuitive because it seems like the algorithm is promoting mass visibility in terms of a strategy. Is that what you found? Well, no, I mean, actually, exactly the opposite is happening at the okay. moment. So I was at the first uh, LinkedIn Focus conference in the UK uh, in the last weeks, and Richard van der Blom was there, who some of you will probably know from his LinkedIn yeah. algorithm report. You know, He revealed to us that his uh, visibility on posts now is only 30%, 30 percent, 30 percent of what it was a year ago. So overall, the visibility that everyone is getting on LinkedIn is going down. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, if you think about your homepage feed, it makes sense. There are more adverts appearing in the homepage feed. There are more posts appearing from particularly the collaborative articles that LinkedIn are trying to push at the moment. Um, yep, there are a few more knows. posts in <laughs> groups. Um, but what that's doing is squeezing out the visibility of everyone mm -hmm. who's posting regularly on LinkedIn. Um, so, so you know, across the board, people are reporting that they are generally seeing lower post reach than they were getting six or 12 months ago. Um, mm -hmm. So the route to achieving success through being famous is, is harder and harder and harder with every month that goes by. Um, mm -hmm. But where, you know, where recruitment teams are having a lot of success is focusing on, so in this research, I'll, I'll share the link later, but the common theme of the, the companies and the teams that are getting great results is they've focused on three things. So they've really focused on how do we build an audience of our ideal prospects? 
And how do we do that consistently so that every week, every month, our recruitment business or our recruitment team reaches more of our ideal audience than we did previously? Um, If you're a recruitment business trying to win new clients, then that audience growth would be oriented around uh, you know, trying to reach more of your ideal client decision makers. Uh, if you're a recruitment team trying to make more hires, then uh, your audience growth will be focused around trying to have greater reach with the candidate pool um, that, that you most want to hire from. Um, but they've all focused down and figured out as a team, how can we collectively grow our audience really consistently um, and we can talk later uh, about some ways that you might do that. Um, the second thing they're, they're all doing is building trust and credibility with that audience through posting. So whilst they're not chasing mass visibility for their posts, what they are saying is, let's say you're I know, a recruitment business focused on the telecoms industry. There might be in your location, there might be a few hundred decision makers in the various telecoms companies who basically are going to determine where, how much business you, you could win over the next years. Uh, it might be a few thousand, depending on you know, the markets you're serving and how big that pool of decision makers is. Um, but they're really focusing on, okay, how can we get as many of those people connected to some of our team on LinkedIn, following our company pages, part of a group that we run, maybe part of a WhatsApp chat group, maybe part of a Facebook group. Um, So they're really focused on that. And then they're focused on posting in ways so that that target audience get to see them regularly uh, and, and come to perceive them as being the experts in telecoms recruitment or, or whatever sector it is you're you're focused in. And then the third thing that they're doing, which is also really key, is figuring out how to convert that audience into becoming clients or becoming candidates that we're working with. So almost without exception, they are not sitting back and waiting for the phone to ring or waiting for people to message them on LinkedIn and say, we have a need, could we start working with you? They're doing more proactive things to get that you know, that win to happen. Um, and there's all sorts of different things that could be. But just as an example, the research that we've been doing with firms about you know, what their experiences with social media have been um, and you know, are they getting great results from it or not, for us, Part of the reason for doing that is to uncover you know, what's working and get some data around that. But part of the reason is because it gets us onto fantastic warm phone calls or Zoom calls you know, with our ideal clients. And so a portion of those calls have turned into client wins for us. Lots more of them have turned into people who now know what our business does and, and refer other potential clients to us. Um, so... Those three things are the three things that I would take away from the call today uh, in terms of what to focus on. Have you as a team really nailed how you're growing your audience and doing that consistently? Um, Have you got activities in place uh, to ensure that you're building trust and credibility with those people? And have you experimented with some ways of converting that audience um, into getting better results. Um, a podcast is another great example, Jane. Across the world, you are seeing recruitment businesses starting podcasts in whichever sector they, they work in. And when you speak to those businesses about their podcasts, they are mostly not doing it for that podcast to go viral and get heard by you know, tens of thousands of people. They're mostly doing it because it gives them a really warm meeting with potential clients that they would like to work with. It's a great way of approaching people. Um, So I've spoken for a long time there. Yeah, Um, no, I love that. I'm listening curiously and carefully. And I think for me, I'm I'm a language person. So I found three T's, the targeting, the niche of decision makers, 
the um, trust being the second T, and the third one being turning into a warm call. So I love that we're moving away from the mass visibility, away from just and trying it, and to... It, visibility. Yeah. And it could be a warm call, but you also have companies doing things like, you know, they're hosting a business breakfast and they get potential clients along to that, or they're hosting yeah. a networking drinks uh, event and they get potential candidates or potential clients along to that. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of different ways, but it's basically taking that relationship you've got on LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever it may be and turning it into more of a real world uh, relationship. Oh, okay, great. Well, there's another T there, taking the relationship <laughs> into the real world. I love that, Tony. So I think with the discussion around trust and around really, you know, a lot of people are talking about being authentic. I ran that poll that I thought I saw you saw this morning as well. And most people were saying authenticity is something that really builds trust for them. I know there are multiple things, but that seemed to really hit a chord with most people. And then, of course, our conversation today is all around the age of AI and people using AI and how do we now use it so that we're effective, but we don't all become robotic and bland. So please tell us a little bit from your view around the age of AI and what you would encourage people to do with it in social selling and social media marketing and what you'd caution people not to do. Oh, such a hot topic. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> the, the first thing I would say is be really careful with using AI to either create content or to post comments on your behalf. Um, there seems to be a blindness mm. once people start using these AI tools that they don't see how obvious it is to other people that they're using them. Um, and it is now, obvious. Yeah, and I can give you some some horrible examples of it. Um, and I will do in just a moment. But particularly from a social selling point of view, if you are trying to you know, build trust and credibility with some key decision makers in your industry, the moment that they feel your comment interactions with them are not you personally interacting with them. That's far worse than you never having commented in the first place. That's actually destroyed, you know, the rapport that you were building up with them. Um, so I would be really, really wary about that. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. So yes. someone very, uh, someone very famous on LinkedIn, uh, an influencer, has launched uh, an AI commenting tool that AI comments on your behalf. Um, leave aside the fact that that um, potentially violates LinkedIn's terms of service, but just in terms of what output it actually produces. And, and I looked on the website at the testimonials uh, of people saying this tool was great. And I went through some of them to, to look at what their recent comments had been. Uh, and there was one classic example where the person who was the founder of a company had replied to someone, let, let's call him Ben, I can't actually remember what his name was, but had said, it's so great to see you here talking in the voice of Ben and telling us all about your thoughts on X, Y, Z, whatever it was. It was the most, you would never as an individual write that. And the person responded and said, who else's voice would I be writing <laughs> In on LinkedIn as what a dumb thing to say. So, you know, but, but this person had turned on this tool, had said, right, I want to interact with these types of people or this list of people, pressed go and allowed it to start churning out comments. And that's the sort of thing that it churns out. Um, there's another new company, uh, and I'm going to be careful about naming names here, but I'll just yeah. you know, flag what's happening. Um, that is offering to comment on behalf of your company uh, on other businesses' posts or other people's posts uh, and to really do it at scale. They're offering to do up to a million comments per month. Just think about wow. that for a moment and how much that is going to impact LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, they commented 
on one of my posts from late last year uh, where I had shared my top list of something for November. And in the post, I'd said, if you've got any suggestions for uh, what you think should be added into my December list, please drop me a comment. Well, in the last weeks, they dropped a comment, autom automated AI comment, that said, I oh, you know, fantastic, and we think that your December list would be made much stronger if you included X, Y, Z. And they posted that in late March or early April, th three months after I'd written my wow. December list. So these, but but this is the problem with turning these tools on. Um, and, and that particular company claims to have the comments generated by AI and then be checked by individuals in their business before they're actually posted out. Yeah. But, you know, you at, at the at the volume that they're doing these things you can't catch all the examples um of of it being you know coming across stupidly um and what's even worse with a company page is you and i can't see what companies have commented recently so if i go to your profile jane i can see all your last comments so i can mm. see the kinds of things you've been saying i can interact with those comments but mm. if i go to a company page i can't see that company's most recent comments and so if someone in a business signs up for one of these tools and it starts churning out huge volumes of ai comments that aren't actually that good it's not going to be obvious to people yeah. in the business that that is happening and that their reputation is, you know, being massively hit um, because they're, they're not going to have that visibility. So, yeah. so that's what I would say on AI tools where I think AI is really good is in saving time uh, in yeah. thinking about things. So yeah. for example, for idea creation, it is fantastic. You know, mm -hmm. if we start work with uh, a, a new client and let's say they say to us, uh, we'd really like to uh, put out a series of posts about, you know, the various ways that candidates should prepare before they uh, embark on a job search uh, and start going to job interviews. Well, if you plug that into one of the AI tools and say, right, what are 10 ideas of things that candidates should do in that situation? you will get a list back that is pretty pretty strong. And if you then take those ideas and write the posts around those ideas, then you've saved yourself a lot of time in coming up with the initial ideas, but the posts themselves or the blogs themselves or whatever it is, you know, still inherently have your intelligence and your expertise right. behind them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one use that I've seen really um, powerful. I actually did an interview uh, in the last weeks that I put out on LinkedIn um, with a sales consultancy, so helping sales teams to be more effective. And one of the big things they flagged is just how much AI can help you prepare for sales meetings uh, in a short space of time. So if you are going to go and have a sales meeting with XYZ company and you want to quickly get up to speed on, you know, what's been happening in their business, what's, what are some of the challenges in the sectors that they serve and that kind of thing. Um, you can get really good insights very quickly from AI, albeit you have to fact check what you get back from AI because every once in a while it will throw up a fact that is, you know, is not accurate. Um, I asked, so on Skype, you have Bing's AI tool built in. I asked that to tell me what it knows about me recently and it churned out, you know, uh, a full page of really concise, good summary of all my background and things that I would put my name to, basically. Yeah. But it had that I was a published author, which I am, but it had uh, the wrong name of the book that I published. Mm. So just that one little thing. You know, had I gone into a sales meeting and, and said, oh, you know, great that you've published XYZ book, um, you know, and that person hadn't published that book, mm -hmm. you can see again, AI can save you a lot of time 
but you have to also be cautious that it could be leading you you know down the wrong path yeah absolutely tony and i think like you say we can spend so much time building trust and building relationships and then just something like that can break trust because immediately there's a sense of do you care that goes along with it like i remember mm. hung lee's one comment was how annoying it is to get automated messages because there's just the sense of it's so unfair that I should respond to this as a human when you just pressed a button and a million people all got the same message. Mm. So I think when okay. I respond to messages, I'm so careful to make it ultra personalized. I want to say, I am not AI. It's really me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but in, in terms of authenticity, you know, conveying a bit of your personality um, is, is really powerful. Um, being yourself if you can stand to put yourself on video that is really powerful i can't tell so during covid we started doing a series of video interviews with uh business owners again it was a great way of getting first meetings with people met a huge number of great people doing that have won lots yeah. of clients from doing that um but in a lot of instances that was the first time that they had ever been recorded on video mm -hmm. and when they put out those videos on their LinkedIn the impact it had was huge because yeah. they would have past clients past colleagues old school friends you know suddenly saw a video in their feed of that person and and they watched it and uh, for people that knew them already it rekindled the relationship but almost more importantly for all the connections they had that had never met them and never had any proper interaction with them, all of a sudden they felt more like they knew that person uh, and some cool requests start flowing off the back of that. So, um, yeah, tr try and infuse a bit of personality. If, if you can bear it to, to run an audio event or do a LinkedIn Live or post a video on LinkedIn or something that gets you seen and heard rather than just your written word, then that is, uh, that's especially powerful. Mm, yeah, I love that, Tony. And I think I've tried to do a couple of those myself recently. And you're right, it does take courage. And I definitely have to get over this is going to be perfect because it's never going to be. But yes. it's just that ability to connect with people, which is so powerful and which is so special and which I know I crave and many people crave. And um, interestingly, I do remember um, back at that time, so it was a couple of years ago, um, mm. you actually did an interview with me on how to succeed in virtual interviews. And I remember yes. that was the very first time I met you. But it was around yeah. that time of how do I show up on camera, you know? How do I connect with people when it's just 2D? But that's the perfect example, Jane. So had I, we've done a, about 200 of those video interviews now, had I contacted all the people that we contacted about doing those and said, you know, I think your social media could do with improving, shall we jump on a call and I can, you know, give you some ideas and talk about how we could help you achieve that. You know, yeah. I'd have got almost no meetings from that. Whereas because the approach was, okay, what would make this interesting for the other person and would help them, then lots of the right people said yes. And so, you know, we yeah. won a lot of client business off the back of that, but also a lot of people like yourself came to know what it is we do, um, you know, interact with our posts, refer business to us. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a perfect example of, you know, uh, a conversion approach effectively. So, so Tony, um, I need to raise something because about um, one person raised this with me recently, an employer, and said, please don't tell anyone it's me. So I won't, <laughs> the person might be in the room. Um, and probably about two other people since then. And I don't know if you get this, but sometimes employers say, I don't wanna be too visible on social media, nor do I want my team, I know, you know the team also needs to create networks, to be too visible or too good in terms of perhaps their LinkedIn profile, because we're finding that they are getting poached. Or maybe we share about the great work we're doing and then other people come in and there's more competition for our contracts. So I don't know if you've had that kind of concern coming your way with the type of work you do, but please do share your view on that or your experiences with that. I think um, if 
your concern is losing your staff because people see them on LinkedIn and think, oh, that would be a good person to poach. Um, if stopping them from being visible on LinkedIn is your best way of preventing that from happening, um, then you've got much bigger problems in your business. Um, you know, focus on all the other reasons why they should want to be excited about staying with your business uh, and get those things right. Um, and then people will be, uh, you know, can be very visible on LinkedIn. And when they get approached, they won't want to leave. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit like recruitment businesses that wanted to hide who all their connections were on LinkedIn so that their competitors mm -hmm. wouldn't know who they were connected to. You know, I've always thought that's uh, a bit fruitless because, you know, with a bit of research, you can find out who all these people are and approach them directly anyway. So it, it, you're hurting yourself more than you're you're helping yourself. Um, so, so that would be my take on that. What's really crucial to understand is your post on LinkedIn as an individual gets 10 times more exposure than the company post gets for the exact same content. If yeah. the two of two accounts have got the same kind of number of followers. Um, and so for most businesses, the power of the individuals in your team to get the brand seen is, you know, completely dwarfs the ability of the company page. Um, and, and, you know, so so when we work with a recruitment business, for example, uh, you know, if they've got that concern, we would say, well, look, if we help your entire team build their LinkedIn networks so that you have saturated coverage of the telecoms market or whichever market it is, it actually then doesn't matter to you too much if someone leaves and takes their network to another agency because across your whole team, you've saturated the market. And the alternative to that is that your team never expand their reach on LinkedIn. And then your whole business doesn't have very good reach in the telecoms market at all. And you've just yeah. shot yourself in the foot to try and prevent people from leaving. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So, so, so I heard yeah. like get individuals to post and then let the company rather repost the individual's posts rather than the other way around in terms of reach. So from a practical point of view, would you also advise that? Yes. I mean, it, it obviously depends what company you're in and how many followers you, you have. But mm -hmm. unless you are in a large corporate that has millions of followers, then what you're putting out in your LinkedIn posts is going to get fairly minimal visibility, mm -hmm. um, which isn't to say it isn't important to do. Clearly, if a candidate goes and checks out your company page, you want them to see that you're active there and that there's some interesting things for them you know, that persuade them to want to join your company. Um, but those that pool of candidates is going to see your brand and your company messages far more if the individuals within the team are all heavily involved in you know, getting that, that message out mm -hmm. there. Um, and within, within any business, it's really a question of seeing who's comfortable with doing that and who isn't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I certainly experience when we work with companies there will be a pool of people within that business that really want to be more visible on LinkedIn want mm. to help the company have more visibility want to be contributing more to them making more placements or winning more new clients and those are the people we'll work with um, and then there'll be some people in the business that just are uncomfortable with that for, for whatever reason sure. um, and we don't personally you know we'll on an initial kickoff call, explain what the benefits are of, of being involved. But if they haven't bought into it at that point, we won't try and, you know, persuade people who just don't want to do it, aren't comfortable with doing it, that they should do it. Mm -hmm. Just work with the people in the business who are really enthusiastic. Because mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, sales is a transference of feelings. So mm -hmm. if someone is excited about being tasked with being more visible and getting better results on LinkedIn, then they will do that. And that enthusiasm will come across if they're yeah. being forced to do it, then, you know, that's going to, you're going to sense that in the, the posts mm. and the interactions they put out anyway. Yeah. And I think that also for me, that's what drains energy from AI automated posts that have not been 
cultivated to be personal, authentic. It just, mm. there's no energy in there. Yes. So, um, and Tony, I know we've talked a lot about LinkedIn. What mm. other platforms do you find that people are winning on? I know it's sometimes industry specific, but are there any others that you would recommend at this at this time? Um, it, it very much depends on the market that you're serving um, geographically, but also sector wise. Um, let, me, let me give you a simple example there. When LinkedIn um, decided to scale back on groups and the visibility of groups, uh, which they did a number of years ago now, a lot of the people that had those groups on LinkedIn uh, moved them across to Facebook. And so one of the first things that we'll do when we work with a new client is look to see if there is a very established and active group for that particular uh, sector on Facebook. And you, you can't say without going and doing the research whether that's going to be the case or not. Sometimes it very much is. And so there's a ready-made audience there that you could go and engage with. Other times it doesn't exist at all. Um, but I would say for our clients and then for the 170 firms that, that we've interviewed, what we found was they were predominantly putting their efforts into LinkedIn. And then they usually had one other platform where they were trying to uh, also, you know, reinforce what they were doing. Um, but that would definitely be one piece of advice from me is don't spread mm -hmm. yourself too thinly. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about what you know about LinkedIn, and there's probably loads you don't know, but but you've got to the point where you know quite a bit about LinkedIn. Um, think how much worse your results would be on LinkedIn if you just turned up to it today and didn't know any of the things that you know about what works and what doesn't work. And now mm -hmm. assume that the same is true of Instagram and the same is true of X, Twitter, the same is true of TikTok. And so it's much better to just be on one or two platforms in terms of really investing effort yeah. um, and becoming good there. Obviously, as a business, as an employer, you may want to have, you know, a profile on all the main social media accounts and that's fine but where mm. you actually invest most of your effort i would keep that focused on you know whichever one or two platforms um uh, are most important for you mm. um okay thanks I've just seen that that post has gone live yes yeah. i was gonna say oh. speaking of linkedin please so do I'll, link to that post i've, I've um, dropped that in the comments um thank you i see it but yeah, yeah so please I mean, do, after yeah. the call, any, any thoughts you've got from today, you know, f feel free to drop a comment there. If you've got any follow on questions, I'd be very happy to, mm. you know, to answer them in there. And hopefully the resource itself will flesh out a lot of what we've been talking mm. about today. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that, Tony. And I love that it's like cutting edge, up to date, just, just done now. Um, Tony, one other question before, um, I know we don't have that much, 13 minutes left. Um, and there might be people who want to ask one or two questions. So before sure. we stop recording and do that, any final tips or things that you think are, are important for people to know when it comes to winning on social media? So there'd be a few things I would highlight. The first is to really have a strategy yeah. and have a strategy that you know works. So the overwhelming majority of the people I've interviewed who can't really point to getting any wins from social media, they are certainly investing time and effort on social media, but what they're doing isn't proven. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you can, it, it's a bit like spinning a propeller in, in the water, but it's not got very good blades. It just spins and spins, but doesn't make the boat go very far. Um, you really want, if you're going to go down the route of trying to achieve mass visibility and get results from that, you really need to, you know, do your studying and understand, okay, how is that achieved? And what do I therefore need to do if I want to be one of those people who is really super visible um, on LinkedIn? And, and that is a, a big undertaking. So I wouldn't do that lightly. Um, similarly, if you're going to go down the route of going after a targeted approach to 
building up a pool of people just in your particular niche, uh, then you need to become expert at, at you know all the elements of that strategy. Um, but but have a strategy. The, one of the worst things that you could do is just leave from today and, and go and sort of carry on posting, carry on doing things. Draw a line in the sand, okay, growing our audience, building trust with our audience and converting that audience. Which of those three things are we doing well? And can we really prove that we're doing well? Um, and, and which of them are we weaker at or we've not, you know, not experimented with? So that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing I would really stress is consistency. Mm. So social media results build and build and build on each other. If you do social media in fits and bursts, um, uh, and this can be a real problem in a recruitment business, for example, you know, you win a whole load of clients, they they send a whole load of work your way, all your team are then working on assignments flat out, no one's got time to do social media properly. And so it doesn't get done properly for a number of months. And then yeah. you fill those assignments, uh, you've not got nearly as many roles to work on. And all of a sudden, people on the team have, you know, some weeks that they could do social media again. That unfortunately produces the worst possible results. So figure out in your recruitment business or your recruitment team how you're going to carve out time to, to do whatever you're going to do consistently. Um, you know, bring in an external agency like ours or hire a freelancer or dedicate someone in the business to have responsibility for this, but do something so that you've got the ability to invest in social media consistently. Um, I would say that is really key. Um, yeah. And then have someone doing it who has the necessary expertise to get results. Um, and to really illustrate the point of that, at Social Hire, we turn away quite a lot of client inquiries each month because they're from businesses where we don't know how to get results for that type of business. So even though we're you know, fairly expert at social media and very good in the, in the particular sectors that we serve. If a recruitment, um, recruitment, if a restaurant chain comes to us and says, you know, could you do our social media and help us get more customers into our pizza restaurants each, each month? Well, the answer is, you know, we could do a professional job for you. You would look quite good on social media, but I don't know how to get more customers into a pizza restaurant each month. So I would actually have to go away and experiment for the next six months with what works and what doesn't work. Whereas if you were to hire a social media manager who already has that restaurant experience, or you bring in a social media agency that already works with restaurant chains, they would know how to get those results, you know, pretty much from day one. Um, mm. So yeah, those three things have a have a proven strategy and, and and follow that and make sure everyone on the team knows what that strategy is so they're all pulling in the same direction um figure out how you're going to be consistent in what you're doing um and then make sure you've got someone leading that that has the expertise of how to get results in that particular you know that particular market mm. oh thank you tony I really appreciate you sharing these tips and I think it's so valuable because it's built on years of experience and expertise. Mm, so some, something that would take someone else such a long time to research and come up with a, maybe I think it's this, you've just been able to say, here it is, here's my experience, here's the expertise, here's what's working. So I really, really appreciate you sharing that so generously. And yeah, I do want to encourage everyone to go to that post that Tony's just shared and share any questions, comments, learning on there. And yeah, so let's open it up for questions and comments. We have seven minutes left. Thank you again so much, Tony. I've loved this conversation and learning from you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.